Hi all, thanks for joining us. Um, should be an exciting conversation tonight around uh, practice design and coaching. Uh, Noddy, thanks for coming, mate. Pleasure. Uh, so just brief introductions. My name's Aaron. I work for the with the national teams, uh, England. Um, been here for nearly four years now. Well, my role is head of specialist coaching. Um, I'm working across different age groups. Nadi, do you want to give yourself a bit of an intro? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm at the FA at the, in the professional game team. I've been uh, recently ahead of coaching and then I was at the FA before that and then Crystal Palace before that. So, uh, yeah, it'd be a good, uh, good chat around practice design. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Now, do you reckon this, uh, this webinar is aimed at tonight? Who do you think it's, it's best based for? I think if you're interested in coaching and you're interested in ideas about coaching, and that, that's what we're talking about, some ideas around practice, around how you can design practice for maximum effect and some of the big picture stuff about practice. So I think it is. Uh, it could be anyone who's interested in coaching. So it, whether you're coaching grassroots or you're coaching uh, some much more advanced players, I think it's relevant for you. Yeah, excellent. Couldn't agree more. Mm. Okay, brilliant. Right, so I'm going to pass you on to your first slide, mate. So if you just want to talk us through this a little bit of the, the why behind the night, really. Yeah, I, th I think this is a simple thought, a, a thing about how the game's moving at the moment. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you try and predict what the game's going to look like in five years' time, well, that's, that's difficult enough. But you do know that now people are playing with different formations and sometimes three or four formations in one game. And uh, they're playing with wingers that are on the wrong side and they're putting on substitutes for maximum impact that are completely different from the player they've taken off. So players have to be adaptable and, and they've got to be adaptable to different circumstances, different players, different formations. And so the question is, is what are you doing in your practice to enable players to, to become adaptive? Not all of them will be experts, so you can take the expertise word or the expert word out. But essentially, you've got the routine player who can apply the core skills fluently and they're more than valuable and much needed. And then you've got these, this crew, the smaller group of uh, players that are able to apply established skills and deal with different situations and challenges that you throw at them. And... Uh, so, for example, a centre a center back uh, who may, may go on loan out of an academy may not have faced a, 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 a big centre forward that, and a team that, that plays long and the centre forward backs into him all the time. And he's got to deal with that, you know. And uh, the question is, is dur during his journey in academies and, and as he's developing, does he get access to all these different scenarios? So it's not new to him. So I think it's really important that we uh, we get players who can adapt to different to those different situations and challenges, and it might mean playing different positions, different formations, and doing that maybe in, you know over one game, in in one game, different the difference. Yeah, yeah, it links really well, Nadi, to uh, something we've been discussing around the national teams around um, what will it take to for our players to thrive in the biggest game. So what behaviours will we see in our players to win the biggest the biggest moments, the biggest games, the toughest moments of the toughest games? And then we break that down to think about like, well, what does that mean for our training programmes? What does that mean for the work that we do? So how do we afford opportunities to develop our players' intelligence and skill and, and everything to thrive in the biggest moments of the biggest games? Yeah, that, that 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 word opportunity is huge. I mean, how how in training do you give players opportunities to adapt? You know, or or is everything in your even in your training it's routinized? So the kid, you know, the players get get into this sort of routine way of being, if you like. And uh, of course, there's routine skills that, that they have to be excellent at. But it's, it is you're right about affording them opportunities to develop intelligence. You know, it's a great sentence. Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. Right, let's try and break it down then into some little, little bit more detail. So, yeah, you, yeah. I think this is a standard thing about how you go from how you you, you end up learning from 
you don't know you're any you, you don't know you're not very good and then you end up being performing the skill automatically and surely the point of uh the the top ex or, or getting to be expert is that you end up doing skills and you don't know you're doing them and that's years and years of practice but that practice has to be realistic relevant and with quality repetition were and fun an opportunity to transfer those skills into a game there's very pointless really if um you're training all the time and not playing you have to be you have to get those transfers into the game because that's how you get feedback on whether you're doing well or not and mostly people will be working in the bottom consciously incompetent and the next bit where you're able to use the skill but only with effort we're pretty much there and in the end you want to end up in the blue box and that takes years so there's a big message of don't rush the process you know trust the process if you have good processes in your practice and your practices are realistic they're relevant you you uh you drive the motivation there's fun there's opportunity to play in games so that you can show off those skills then you're more likely to 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 get more players with more skills in that blue box and it's interesting because uh if you ask some some top players they don't know why they do certain things they just do them and that's because they've been practicing them over years and years and have opportunity to do it so the rushing things a big thing is about we don't need to rush this development there is a rush to go into 11v11 there's a rush to get kids into formations into positions and and so on and so forth but the the problem with that is that you may have missed over some of the absolute essential skills that they need you know in individual skills and in pairs and in 2v2s and 3v3s so it's a really big message about stop rushing the process yeah i know a a uh friend of both of ours you would always talk about uh, you don't feed a baby a sunday roast <laughs> no 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 break it exactly. Down and... exactly and and you know we, we we were very keen just because of their age that is going into um 11 v 11 and and then formations and 442 and 433 and and in retrospect some kids really like that if they if if they're grassroots and they just want to they just want to play with their mates and so on and so forth but the ones who really want to get better and, and 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 get to those blue boxes and want to be the top liners they need to practice the individual skills more and more and more and that and that takes time and i i, I think that we have an obligation to just slow down a little bit you know yeah. stay on task for a bit longer stay with skills for a bit longer and keep revisiting them till you're absolutely sure that they've gotten before you move on yeah i think you have to be brave as a coach to be able to do that as well so um yeah sometimes you don't see the res the results or the returns instantly and you have to play the longer game and be patient and, and yeah. trust the process like yeah. and you may get pressure you may get pressure to win games you know yeah there may be pressure coming from different angles that you to win games and sometimes that's difficult to manage yeah okay brilliant um so what I wanted to do at this point was kind of break down a little bit of the process that we've used around the England teams. Um, when it comes to, pra to to thinking about our training sessions, thinking about going on the grass and working with uh, some really exciting players up and down the country and um, and get some work together. So we, what we did was we looked at the coaching fundamentals that were set out in the England DNA. And we tried to we tried to break them down to come up with come on what are the core what's the core message that we're trying to get out of this what's the what's the essence of what we're trying to say when it comes to practice design and and, and training and we came up with these kind of four buckets really around planning the learning creating the learning environment coaching the learning environment and then reviewing the learning environment and we felt that 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 cycle and that process and those four buckets were really key for us um, so. And just walk you through the, the the four. When it comes to planning, we felt it was really important that we spent equal time planning to delivery. Um, it's probably we do more planning than we do delivery, so we'd spend a lot of time off camp before we get the players in to discuss what do we want to work on, why do we think we need to work on it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the the plan always had to have a a purpose. It had to have a relevance. So. 
it had to be linked to either the how we play principles, the periodization of the week, where we thought we were at, the individuals that we had within the session, or maybe opposition analysis with some of our older age groups around, this is who we're coming up against. We need to get some of this work put into the, into the training plan. And then before we get out on the grass, we wanted to connect with the players. So we wanted to connect with the group, make sure they understood the objectives of the session, make sure they were um, really clear on, on, on what it was we were going for today and, and pose them. That might be video clips in the dressing room. It might be using the big screens in the gym. So they go in the gym to do an activation session. We put some clips on with them. Or it might just be as simple as uh, as uh, WhatsApp in a message or speaking to a few of them before we get on the grass and just to frame a few things up. Now, did you think there'd be any questions that coaches would have around that first area? Yeah, I, I think the the, the 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 emphasis that you put on planning to delivery is really is really a strong point because you know you, you you're planning for success if you can and uh, and that that's not something you can rush and if that planning is relevant to your game plan then uh, and you get coaches to think well it's got to be relevant to the philosophy it's got to be relevant to the, the ability of the players it's got to be relevant to the, the way we want to play and it's that relevance that that drives the motivation of the players because when they see it working in the game and that's why the planning the planning for relevance if there was ever a term it's planned for relevance do you know what i mean yeah. and i think that that's really vital and what you're saying is plan link and connect aren't you you know and yeah. uh they're words that, that that should be embedded in in each coach's sort of um psyche if you like you know connecting with the group is uh really important at the beginning this is what we're doing and also connecting with the time that you're doing it you know because sometimes if it's a physical punch, you say, listen, lads, you're going to be doing this for this time, yeah. you know, and be up front with the with all the planning so that they know, you know, there, there's no doubt about what they're, they're supposed to be doing. The thing about the objectives for me is, is there's got to be a few of them and you've got to focus on them rather than have loads of them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that otherwise you will lose the, in my opinion, you will lose the, uh, the focus. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we'll build on some of that as we go through the yeah, I'm sure, yeah. slides. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, some good stuff on that. Okay, brilliant. So the next bucket for us then is about creating the learning environment. So what kind of environment do we want training to look like? And there were some big, some big strides that we made on this over the, in the early years really of, of transforming like what we, what we wanted England sessions to look like. So first idea of carouseling game related practices was around right do all of our sessions look like the game first and foremost they've got to have the essence of the game at the center of it so it's got to it's got to be game related but the carousel approach was around time management so it was making sure we wasn't wasting time finishing one session setting another one up and and those dead minutes in between the in the session so we want to be really skillful with our coaches around getting that carousel uh, based process 70% ball rolling time, I think, had a big impact across the game around you know, the, the players are here to play. The players are here to, to, to practice and to, to get the opportunities to make their own decisions and, and get the work done. So it doesn't, doesn't have to be 80% the coach controlling, stopping, talking and, and working the group. It could be more let them go, let them practice um, and then intervene at the right moments, uh, which will come in the next bucket. Um, and then this this idea of directional with transitions, I think, was quite pertinent for us in international football. So in terms of our principles, we spoke a lot about we wanted England teams to, to look forward and play forward. We wanted England teams to break lines. And if we had direction in our sessions, we'd always be able to challenge their decision making on when to play forwards or when to show control and patience and maybe play square and backwards and draw the opposition out for the next moment to go forwards. So we try and get direction into our sessions as much as possible, keep it game related. And then building transitions in was really, really important for us. So we kind of knew that if you was playing against England, transitions would be an area that you'd try and hurt us on. Um, we knew because we want to have the ball, we'll risk it. If we lose it, we want to go and get it back early, but we want to be secure behind it. But also when teams attack us, we want to be able to attack them back quickly and be able to hurt them in transition. So transitions were a big part of our sessions. And I just want to 
uh, pause here just to share a share a practice really just to share a session um oh, not this one let me just get the session up so i just wanted to share a practice with you so if you imagine a traditional rondo where you've got a circle of players uh, keeping the ball away from two in the middle uh, so a rondo or a circle or a piggy in the middle whatever whatever terminology we wanted to call it um the essence of that practice, uh, there's lots of good returns from it, um, but it's non-directional and there's no transition in there. So you get the defenders in the middle, they'll just kick the ball out of play, they'll just kick it off the pitch. Or So we just looked at a simple concept here of a four versus two exercise where you've got two blacks, two blues and two yellows. And they're going to play two v one in each half of the box. So you can see the ball there started, the blacks give it away. Yellows are now in possession, so the blacks are pressing. I'm going to keep the blacks in the middle. And we're playing 2v1 in each half. If they kick the ball off the pitch, they haven't won it. We want them to try and win it and keep it. So I'd reward them if they kept pressing and pressing and pressing and, and blocking. I'd reward their efforts. But you can see it's a bit messy. It's a lot more transitional. It's a bit more directional. So they're trying to get it across the halfway line into the two blues. Two blues are trying to get it. Yellows win it. Can we keep it? So it's a, it's a real live, um, real live game related directional with transitions and lots of decisions going on in that in that exercise. Hmm. Any observations, mate? Yeah, I think um, I think directional with transitions is, is a, a, a great rule because uh, with the younger ones, the more directional it is, there's always a left, there's always a right, there's always a forward, there's always a back. So they get a football, what I call a football compass. You can say left, right, forward and back. So if you're saying always be in a position to play forward and you're in a circle, that's really difficult because only the way you're facing. And you can't, and I often think of defenders when you're doing things like that. If you wanted to, if you want a principle of getting goal side, ball side, it's really hard if you're just in a circle running around chasing the ball. So you have to think about how important the direction is because you just need to take the doubt out that that's left, that's right, that's forward and that back. And that helps with support and angles and all that. And I think it's really important. The other thing for me is, is that we, we, often we, we have a topic of transitions and I think it should be built in every day and what you do all the time. Yeah. You know, sometimes we isolate it as a, a phase of the game. It happens so regularly that, you know, and at the top line, it's pretty much you either plan for count, you either plan to nick the ball back or it's pretty much unstructured and unplanned. With the younger ones, it's it just happens. Yeah. And so in all your practices, you should be sort of uh, uh, looking at transitions. You know, it's not, I don't think it's right that, you know, you get a defender and go, OK, give it back to the opposition. You know, well, really, you know, do something with it if you win it back. So I think that's that's absolutely sound. The seventy percent ball rolling is is critical because if you if you if you want them to if you, if you want them to get better, they've got to play more football and the ball's got to roll more repetition. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Right, let's take you through the last couple of buckets then. So so now this this idea of coaching the learning. So this is where the coach would get involved and the coach would come in and then pack the session. So we'd want an inspiring manner. Now that manner. 90% of the time, hopefully, is positive, is enthusiastic, is energising. Sometimes it might not need that. Sometimes it might need something else to get the group going. Uh, but we want that inspiring manner all the time. Um, we've got to be stretching the players in all four corners. We're not just technical and tactical coaches anymore. We've got to be physical coaches. We've got to be psychologists. We've got to be stretching and challenging, growing our players in all areas um, to, to, to develop these adaptive performers and to develop these players that are going to thrive in the biggest moments of the biggest games. And then having a bit more of a facilitative approach as a coach, so facilitating the learning and the engagement. Now, this is something I'm going to speak a little bit more about as we go through the presentation, but around um, where does the knowledge sit? Does the knowledge sit with the coach? And is it the coach's job to disseminate that? Or does the knowledge sit with the players? And actually, we want to share that knowledge and we want to draw that out of the players and really make sure we get that balance right. I think, I th I think the stretch players is really... Uh, I'm drawn to that because, uh, you know, you want high challenge. You know, you want a high challenge in all those areas you talked about. But with that has to come high support. 
you know, if you're asking the players and you're asking them and you're really challenging them and you want them to be adaptive, they're going to make mistakes. And you have to support those mistakes. You know, if you're not willing to take that risk and, and, and deal with that, give them that support network, then it's really hard to high challenge them. You know, so I, I think that's really important that you stretch the players in four corners, but you back that up with high support. You know, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's really important. Excellent. Um, OK, so the last one then would be around the, re the review process. So the training sessions taking place now. We we think it's really important for our national teams around getting spending time reviewing it, get back together as coaches and with the players and and, and go through that. And then consolidate the learning. So go through the learning cycle, consolidate the learning. That might be to an individual, a unit or the whole team. Um, but ju just make sure we're capturing the learnings that are going on in the sessions. And then making sure we link that session to something that's coming next. So it might be linked to the next session or it might be linked to um, an individual development plan or a future game plan. And we like to use lots of training clips in our game plan meetings. So... They, could, they can relate back to actually, yeah, I remember us doing that and that was really important because it's going to come on, it's going to come on Saturday, it's going to come in the game. Um, and then with us uh, in the international world, we would deliver that through a multidisciplinary team and a specialist coaching model. So we'd have different coaches with different roles and responsibilities to play and but making sure the MDT is part of it, like we said, with stretching the players in all four corners, we want to make sure it's a, a real holistic view to the, to the session. So that kind of model there would what we would um, hold ourselves against really as coaches and really want to be really good in all those four areas of good at planning, good at creating an environment, good at impacting and coaching it in the right way and then reviewing it afterwards. And that, those reviews prompt the next plans, don't they? So, you, uh, you know, yeah, the it's circle, cycle. you know, they, yeah. they all go round and if, 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 if you are one that can take the review and then and then build on your plans the next time then you're, you're you're not doing bad yeah excellent okay let's keep moving forward then so um i know there's some bits that you think are really important that you'd like to talk about as well well it's basically the it is um the really you've talked about it before and and in in order for the practice to be to do its job it has to you have to practice the demands of the game it's simple but you have to know the demands of the game. So I think it's the responsibility of coaches to really study the game. What is it you're actually looking at? You know, and the realism is also in the environment. If you're in grassroots, why, why are the kids there? You know, are they there to be with their mates? You know, you know, you have to, you have to maintain this. If they're in an academy, they're there for a purpose. They're there to get better. And so you have to drive that environment. The obvious ones are the tactical, technical and uh, mental, physical and social sort of realisms, you know, like and that's that's um, that's linked to ages. But if you look at tactical, tactical things, for example, I mean, how if I mentioned individual tactics to people, they would go, oh, I don't know what that is. You know, tactics is more about formations. But what about the realistic moves or the receiving skills you know what are the real moves that you have to to be good at in order to become excellent at receiving skills i think the task of the coach is to really of the coach is to really look and say to themselves do i really understand the demands of the game and do i really understand the, the demands of the skills of the, in the game and uh, it's probably uh, and i remember a um a, a player a first team player and I was at Crystal Palace and I was doing a coaching session and he floored me he pretty much floored me and he said uh, I wouldn't do that in a game and that is oh that's like oh dear <laughs> you know so and yeah and when I regain consciousness I'll, I'll probably you know I'll, I'll sort of like <laughs> I've got my act together so the next one would be on relevance and uh yeah, you've got to practice the demands of the game, but you also got to practice to the needs of the players, what ages they are, what stages, in the end, what positions. But I think it's really important that you practice to the demands of the philosophy and to the game plan if you're in that environment. It might not be so prevalent in um, grassroots, but certainly if you're doing practices that are 
meant for senior people when you're dealing with under 10s then the the boys are going to be or girls whoever you're taking it's going to be they're, they're not going to see the relevance but most important about relevance is that they have to show that in games you can practice all you like but they have they can if they're playing games and can see that they are trying to transfer some of that into games then the next practice they'll think it's more relevant more and more relevant and it's funny because players that are not playing they lose this drive they lose this well it's not relevant it's not it's not for me you know and i look at um, at the higher level i look at possession practices and say who's that really for you know who's that for is it for midfield players because yeah who's it for what about him as a center back what about a goalkeeper what's relevant for him and sometimes you know you have to think uh, the needs of the players, uh, the position is quite important, especially with goalkeepers, even at grassroots. What are you can do with him? You know, what's a relevant practice for him? So I think those two are really important. And then finally, the repetition for me. And it's not about repetition per se. It's the quality of that repetition. So group numbers, for example, you know, if you've got one ball between 16, it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take a mathematician to work out that if you split that in half, there's one ball between eight, and so on and so forth, or one between four, or or whatever it is. So you can, with your practice management, you can manipulate the numbers to guarantee more repetition. And I often see sometimes I say, yeah, well, we've got a small area, I can't do this. I said, well, a little bit of planning, you can use that area better. And why play eight? If you want repetition and you're playing eight v eight why don't you break that down into two 4v4s and then go 8v8 later? And uh, the information you hand out and the focus, in other words, if you're giving too much information and stopping the practice, and that's your point about 70% ball rolling, yeah. you know, it's really important that you pick and choose the time that you give out information because if you keep giving out information and stopping the practice, that repetition drops. And uh, I think... The syllabuses, sometimes the syllabuses can be far too detailed and you're not sure what you're repeating. Um, this is an order that um, I think would help is that, and it's, it's pretty easy really in one respect, is you observe the game, you put the skills under the microscope in that game, you take those skills, you put them in some sort of order and you practice them. And the critical thing is to stick them in a game and watch for the transfer. You know, you wouldn't go far wrong if you follow them. But if you look at number one and two and says, right, observe the game. What do you see? What Take those skills and really put them under the microscope. Then take them out and dump them into a practice. But you also have to put them in some sort of order. So if you're doing defending, what's the first thing? If you're doing pressing, for example, and that, that's what you want to do, what's the first thing? Oh, nearest the ball presses, if that's what you want. Well, focus on that then. Put that in order. That's number one. What's number yeah. two? What's number three? Practice, and then we can discuss that later. But watch for the transfer. Yeah, yeah that, that's really Excellent. important. I want to share uh, another session at this point. Um... Can I say something about repetition, Aaron? Yeah, please. You do? Yeah. You know, just be careful that it's not, it's, it's repeating key elements of the game and the skills. It's not re unopposed practices, rep yeah. boring repetition over and over again. That's great. So that was the, that was my question. That I really wanted to. I was really excited for you to go through the three R's and and get to the repetition point because I've read a lot and looked at a lot of coaches that talk a lot about repetition without repetition. Yeah. So it's, it's putting the skills in different environments under yeah. different. Yeah. They don't know they're repeating it. They're just playing. They're just they're putting the same skills into a game. That's a very skillful coach yeah. that does that. Yeah, and then I, I recently attended a virtual Lego conference talking about creativity and they had this real great uh, piece around like iteration. So it's about doing something, getting it wrong, doing something, tweaking it, got it wrong again, doing something else, tweaking yeah. it, oh, got it wrong again. And then it's like that learning process of mistake, fail, improve, yeah. go, yeah, iterating yeah. all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, really yeah. exciting. So I wanted to share this session with you as a, as a bit of an example of that. So what we've got here is we've got um, five yellow attackers and four uh, non-bib defenders. Um, so the five attackers are going to have waves and waves of attack and maybe like four-minute blocks. So they're going to have as many attacks as they can get in in four minutes. 
Um, but I'm going to put different constraints on the defenders. So if we look at the um, if we look at the first clip, the defenders are going to defend quite high line. I'm going to pause it there. I know that get that little image on the screen. But so the setup here is we're working width for the 18 yard box and kind of like three 18 yard boxes up. I've got four target goals around the halfway line. So if the defenders with it, they've got transition. So they can go and play into a target goal. They've got something to go and go and attack. And that means if the attackers lose it, they've got something to go and defend. So get the ball back or defend the goals. Um, and for the first four minutes, I'm asking the uh, the defenders to hold quite a high line. So they're holding a high line. The five attackers are going to try and break them down. So the first one, little give and go, running behind. And that's our first solution to try and create and score. Recover back up. We go again on the next ball. So next ball comes in, five against four. Many different ways can we get in behind them? So now we're going to work little little runs, little slide balls and runs and penetrative movement off the back. So although the, the picture is similar in terms of the back line, the solutions are different. That's the first block. The next block now, we're going to go a little bit lower. So now I'm going to ask the defenders to hold the edge of the 18-yard box. I'm going to move my target goals up. So 30-second drinks break get the target goals dragged up. So now we've got a similar scenario, but a different picture. So the defenders are slightly deeper. Um, what are we looking for? Well, we can still be looking to work little runs in behind and balls over the top. So we can be working different, different ways to penetrate. Um, again, so all our attacking principles of movement, threat, skill, 1v1 attacking play, combinations, great right, little touch, turn, finish. And then the final block of four minutes, I'll take them inside the 18-yard box now. So I'll remove the spacing behind. I'll put them in a really, really tight area. I'll ask them to show the composure and the creativity in tight spaces to try and work goal scoring, goal scoring finishes and clever little finishes through defenders' legs. The, the interesting thing about this session is actually the closer to the goal that we get, the more composed we have to be and the more creative yeah. we have to be to try and to try and work our way in. Yeah. But I thought it was a nice example of repetition without repetition. So yeah, yeah, yeah. tap versus defence, waves of attack, defenders working really hard to be resilient and defend the goal, but attackers being creative under three different pictures. And, and the, the thing about quality repetition, you know, it, it's like the, the point you're making about repetition without repetition, if you see what I mean, is it's still 5v5. It's just different scenarios. Yeah you know, yeah. four defenders and a goalkeeper, and you're just throwing different challenges at them all the time. You know, but there was very similar things happening over and over yeah. again. That's yeah, that's definitely. it. But then there's the other repetition of individual skills, you know, like ball striking and things like that. That's, a, that's another animal. But what you've illustrated there is a perfect example of how you get players to understand different, scenarios you may play a high line you may play against someone that's dropped off yeah in the end you might play again in a compact penalty area yeah. just do the same things yeah in those scenarios yeah. yeah right talk to me about message discipline mate because i know this is something that you're really passionate about uh yeah this is um and in the current political climate this is this is pretty relevant you know because uh I think message, message discipline is really important. I think if you if you asked clubs and, and everyone's got a code of conduct and they've got a they're pretty they're pretty disciplined in terms of message on kit and 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 all the all the the things to do with conduct and behaviour and stuff. Uh, and they're on the walls and things. So yeah, if you do that, that that that's the message. If you play for us, you're going to do this, so on and so forth. I get that. But how can you can take it into to practice and, and coaching, you know? And I I've, I picked up now, like particularly if you if you if you listen now during these these tough times and and the government uh, are doing a they do their briefings every day and and they've got just a simple message underneath each of one of those lecterns, you know, and they repeat it over and over again. And some people say it ends up brainwashing. I get that, but in the end, you, you're pretty clear. There's three things: stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives. There, those three things. Previously, it was get Brexit done. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So anyway, so if we go, uh, if you, if you, if you take this message round and you take that idea, 
that you pick a few things, you prioritise them, you simplify and clarify it, you add a bit of football into it. In the other words, you, you say, you know, a bit of emotion, but you stay on message. And I think one of the big issues is, do we really stay on message long enough? So if you want kids to be skillful, if you want, like you've just showed in your practice, you want forwards to be creative, then stay on message. Just pick a few things that you want them to do. You may change the environment, but prioritise them and simplify and clarify them but stay on that message. I have a sneaking suspicion that there's some huge syllabuses out there, but I'm not sure what the message is. Uh, so, for example, I was working with some forwards um, at Brighton and uh, we were working on their timing. And I was doing a practice and, and the practice is was very simple. You get a crossing and you, you get on the end of it and uh, this end. But all I wanted them to do was focus on contact. I said, just this thing, we'll do movement later, we'll do everything else later, but on this particular 15, 20 minutes, I want you to focus on contact. So all my um, sort of verbal stuff to them was contact, contact. Just make a good contact, contact. And believe it or not, it improved their timing, but the message was nothing else than contact. And when I got feedback from them, they said, that's really made it easy for us. You know, and then we worked on right movement, movement. So we broke that down. That might be a bit extreme, but the, the, what I got from it was that improve their timing. And then we moved. We said, well, let's look at your movement and contact, and so on and so forth. But we only had a few things that we worked on. I think there's a danger of people working on a lot of things, but not very well, and not, yeah. not long enough. And then your behaviour and your message, you keep all that in sync. So if you're telling people that you want, um, I don't know, you want uh, you want good contact on, 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 on a cross like that, and then they blast it over the bar and stuff like that, you've got, that's got to be reflected in your behaviour. And if you, if you want creative players and you want inventive players, and that's the message, your behaviour, your coach behaviour has to reflect that because otherwise they won't trust you. So I think this message discipline is really important. When I share this with coaches, I quite like it because I think that it's, it becomes easy to put prioritise things. The hardest thing is to prioritise things. What do you think is important? Yeah. If you think it's important, simply fly it and clarify it and then stay on message. There, that's the point about message discipline. Yeah, I like it. I like yeah. it. And that's, uh, I think we like the three R's and trying to make things memorable and yeah. like your key takeaways from your sessions, your key, your key learnings from looking at things mm. and content like this mm. always I, challenge people and like, come on what's what's the key message you want people to go home with yeah i i urge i urge people to have a look at this message discipline because it is a very strong way businesses operate it, it's it, and in practice kids like it because it, it takes out the doubt and it frees okay. you up to it frees you up a little bit as a coach brilliant okay let me have a go at it then so um <laughs> yeah, here we go. let me see how i get on so uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Dittmer, who's head of goalkeeper, and he texts me recently and says, come on, how do you get a session from your brain to the grass? He says, come on, give me a bit more. And he says, no, no, that's all I'm giving you. That's, you've got one question. How do you get your session from the brain to the grass? And I went away and reams of notes, reams of writing, like, like all the type of things that I'd consider and uh, debate going into a session and just come up with like my three key ones. So... Um, the first one would be around context. So what's driving the work that you're doing? So what's the the real purpose behind what you're doing? Is it is it the periodization of what's gone before this season, what's to come after uh, this session, what's to come after this session? Is it where we're at in the in the day, the camp, the pathway, the week, the season? The, um, is it our tactics and principles? So is it like how we play? Is it the philosophy of the club? Is it the philosophy of the teams? Uh, is it our opposition analysis that's driving our session? Is it the individuals that I've got available to me today? So how many players have I got? Who's missing? Who needs what? What are their individual programmes? So I think the context of the session is always kind of like my first, the first thing I want to get out of my head. Like the first thing I want to get out is around like, come on, what's the real relevance of this? What's, what's really driving my work? Um, next would be the constraints. So, what do I want the practice to look like and what constraints am I going to put on the practice and what messages do I want this practice to give my players? 
So if it's directional and transitional, it's giving them some messages around. I want you to think about playing forward. I want you to think about breaking lines. I want you to think about what you do when you lose the ball or what you do when you win the ball back. So what are the constraints that I'm putting on it? So that might be the environment, like where are we training, big areas, small areas, uh, the time and space we're going to give them. Is it street football? Is it a, a really, um, really controlled environment? What intensity do we want to work at? Um, the task, so are, is it a skill practice? Is it a phase or a function of play? Is it an 11 v 11? So I've shown already today like a, a small possession practice, an attack versus defence kind of functional practice where we're working through different different lines. Um, how am I going to create repetition without repetition in my exercise? And then what what's the... Uh, What's the constraints I'm putting on players? So are they playing in position, out of position? Um, am I going to turn, try and pair some people up and go best v best? Am I going to get some positional battles going within my session? So all that thought process around, right? I know the context of what I'm trying to do and why I'm trying to do it. How's my session going to talk to my players? What, what environment am I creating? And then the last one for me would be around uh, the clarity. So how am I going to teach it? So what methods am I going to use to promote the learning in this practice? And this has been a real, a real deep dive for me, mate. A bit of a, like a, a battle with myself as a coach around like, where does the knowledge sit? How much do I talk versus let them practice? Um, how much of my sessions are, are really controlling and, and coach led and how much of my sessions are environment led and the coach is there to facilitate and support and, and, and help them learn. So, like, message message discipline, mate. I've tried to go for three Cs. I've tried to keep it as simple as possible mm. and just work through logically what would come out of my head to get a session from my brain onto the grass. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and that, that simplicity. And I think the clarity is the hardest bit in... in, in because you, you you think do I do I let them go do I stop this bit do I yeah you know, and and that comes with experience and in the end if you get feedback from the players you'll soon know what method works to be honest yeah <laughs> you got to be receptive to the players because actually for and this goes back to relevance you know and, and relevant about how you talk to players and what you do because some players you you just need to leave alone you know and others you you might whisper in their ear and. And it's about your personality, I think, you know, you know, and the, the kids, the kids or players will forgive you if you are, if you help them, you know, yeah. I think we get bogged down with the methods a little bit and worry too much about them, but and not get enough feedback from the kids. Yeah. yeah, definitely. That's been, that's been a massive help for me getting, getting feedback from the players and talking to them about. What well, works, it's work. something we're not comfortable with, but they're the, probably the most honest, you know. And I, yeah, I, I, yeah and, and I, there's always someone in your group that will give you the, the honest answer. So just go and find them and say, what, what do you think of that? Yeah. And he'll soon tell you. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, if he, if he don't, his dad will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. Yeah, um, no. yeah, so what this has kind of spat out at the other end is a bit of like a practice continuum or something I'm trying to get coaches to think about and consider or when I'm coaching I consider or where I, when I go to watch other coaches work I consider and I think coaches always fall somewhere on this spectrum and it is a it is a continuum it's not a book it's not like you're at one end or the other I think you, you dial it up you dial it down and you're moving around it quite often um, but at one end of the, one end of the practice continuum um, it would look quite control based so this would be very much coach led. Uh, the, the message of clarity is coming from the coach. Stop, stand still. Mm. When this when this moment arises, these are the solutions I want to see. These are the actions that I want to see. And that might those messages might again be delivered to the individual, to the units, or to the team. But it's quite a controlled end of the spectrum, quite a, a balanced end of the of the mm. practice continuum. Um, at the other end. It would be a bit more chaotic. It would look a little bit more like the game. So it would be unpredictable. It would be volatile. Um, it would be challenging. Um, and these end of the, this end of the spectrum, I think your sessions quite often look like competition. So they look like the game. Or this idea of like co-adaptation, this idea of like problem solving. So there's one team that's causing a problem and another team that's trying to solve the problem, trying to work out what's going on and trying mm. to adapt and 
Uh, mm. and that might be a 1v1 battle by the way that might be mm. you're quicker than me and I've got to find a different way of beating you now so mm. that co-adaptation bit I think is really really important but uh, all, all I'm all I'm trying to find in my coaching is the balance uh, and if we're going after this how we afford an opportunity to develop players intelligence to thrive in the biggest games mm. I think we need a balance and I think if we if we're too controlling if we're too prescriptive and if we're too coach led all the time uh, in the biggest moments of the biggest games they're going to need us to solve the problems and they're not going to be able to do it quick enough in game live to be that adaptive performer yeah and and um some kids like control they they like they, they some you know and and actually when you take a session you pretty much start controlling and then you free it up at the end you know this continuum is is quite fluid you know you, you can't say I, th I think most coaches sort of if, if they if in the end you want these adaptive experts and and you, you want that repetition without repetition as as, as as you've termed then then you're going to have to be towards the red you know, yeah. but you have to manage that. You know, yeah. it's not about putting on games. You know, games as a teacher is really misunderstood. You don't just put it on and just watch it and go, oh, that was nice. You know, you, you have, it's a very skillful job to manage the chaos. You know, yeah. that is harder. Yeah. Funnily enough, that's harder than, um, than, than doing the control bit at the bottom. And that yeah. maybe why more inexperienced coaches go towards the control because it's, it, it, it may be easier. You know, so I think it's uh, it's really valid. You know, Brilliant. I just wanted to offer up some um, some kind of strategies that you'd manage this kind of continuum, really, and and the, the colours the colours are quite important as well. So the blue and the red. So um, stole this a little bit from the All Blacks around the red head, blue head thinking. Yeah. So if you if you want blue head thinking in the game, if you want that real clarity thinking in the game and that calmness and composure. You've got to expose them to some of the redhead stuff in training and in practice. Mm. So we've got to get yeah. them out of their comfort zones yeah. a little bit and, and get that. Eddie um, Jones but, is big. Eddie Jones is big on that. Yeah, he's been great at that. Yeah, he's been, been really good. I mean, so if I if I wanted to do a, a quite a control based session, I'd be thinking about applying structured start positions, maybe taking transition out of it, so remove the transition so it's a little bit clearer. Mm. Use instructions to show patterns. Have a command style of coaching do some repetitive technical exercises or some repetitive patterns of play. And listen, I'm not saying these are negative. Like my bias takes me more towards the chaotic side of the model. Yeah. Uh, but I know there's times and places where we need to do this kind of work and I need to have command style coaching. I need to have these real control based sessions to get my messages out to introduce something new, maybe, or to, to offer clarity to a problem they can't quite solve themselves yet. They're mm. not quite ready for that moment yet. Mm. Um, so there would be some steps there. But then if I wanted to, to work more chaotically, I want to allow ebb and flow. I want it to look like the game. I want it to be back and forth. I want transition to be in there as much as possible. I'm going to allow the players to find solutions for themselves, try and work things out and go through that iteration process or that, that struggle problem solving and, and get there. Um, I might have a bit more of an empowering coaching style. So make sure the players, players are engaged in the learning, make sure they're, maybe doing a bit of peer-to-peer -peer work, getting some feedback from them. They're talking first, not always me, not always the coach. Um, I, think, I like to think about skill practices. So how do I put a technique under the influence of pressure, time, space? So not just a technical practice, like a skill practice. How am I really stressing those techniques? And I just think a lot of it is about game pictures under game demands. So how do we recreate, how do we recreate those real, real tough moments in games under those... Uh, under those game demands, mm. and that um, th that is very clear about so, so applying structured start positions, for example, you know that is, uh, and uh, that that is can be unrealistic, but sometimes it enables the control of the practice so that they can the kids can be free. Yeah, you know, you use some of the blue to promote the red, the white. The, the, the sorry some of the blue to promote the red yeah i just wanted to share this um this as an as an example of that really so a chaotic kind of 11 v 11 practice so um we can do 11 11 v 11 like walkthroughs tactical walkthroughs or we can do 11 v 11 tactical warfare so where there's uh different 
one team setting problems, another team trying to find solutions. Um, so this was a session we did with an England team on camp. It was me and me and another coach working together, co-coaching. Uh, he was working on the defensive team, trying to set us problems. And I was working with the attacking team on trying to work out what was going on. Uh, so there's three there's three video clips. I'll try and pause them after each one to explain uh, what what scenario we've set the players. Um, so the first one is uh, the blue team are pressing against the black team. I'm working with the black team in possession. Uh, and their fullbacks, the blue team fullbacks, they're the only two players on the pitch that have been given any information. And they've been told to man mark their wide players really early. So if you look at that blue black, back line now you see a big gap between the center back and the and the full back um and i'm looking at the attacking team can they work that out can they find those solutions and and, and get those passes through there or, or find that space and they don't always get it right but it was just creating a problem to try and find a solution um the next scenario uh again look i've just dropped another ball in so i'm dropping a second ball in and creating a little transition moment uh, the next scenario was that the two wide players for the Blues now have been given some information around pressing and we want them to go and press against our centre-backs. Now, the black team haven't received this information. They're just, the ball's popped up here. They've got to find a way and they've got to find a play. So, you can see the blue winger going to press in early. Goalkeeper recognises it first time. Space is beyond him. We build. The winger goes to little bounce out. Winger goes to press again. It's a solution, a little bounce out of a midfield player and we're forward. So really good, positive example to use with the players of going, actually, you've re in that instance there, you've recognised the problem that the blue team are trying to set you. The wingers are trying to press and mm. you find a solution to get out against it. Mm. And then the third and final clip, once they've had this attack. This was actually uh, in preparation for playing against Portugal. So Portugal... Uh, play four one four one and press either with their wingers really aggressive pressing, or they press with their two central midfield players really aggressive and pressing. So again, we just had another block of time where I asked the out of possession coach, the defence coach, to just create this scenario where the midfield players were going to come out. So if you notice here now, their two central midfield players are really high and advanced, pressing up, pressing in around our centre mids, and we've got some space in between the lines for us to go and try and exploit. Um, they actually press really well and they and they, they get like a little interception. But it's just us trying to recognise, well, where's the space? It's really mm. clear for me as a coach afterwards with a video clip and mm. the nice high angle to, to recognise it and spot it. But it's just, just creating those implicit learning moments in training, those chaotic moments. Mm. Uh, of setting some problems and, and allowing the pro the players to try and find the solutions. Yeah, you, you're throwing in curveballs and saying, "Go on." Yeah. Then. So maybe just play this one Hit through again. One. So look, first scenario. Yeah. Fullbacks marking, marking in early. Mm. So there's three different three different tactical scenarios here. Really, fullbacks man marking the wingers early, and that space, those gaps to try and try and exploit and get through. And then, and then it'd be interesting afterwards to get the feedback from the defenders to say, you know, well, what, what did you, you know, how did you deal with that? You know, what did you do? And you can see it on video, but that's where you get your review. You know, you yeah, get the feedback, yeah. and they get yeah. and get feedback from the players and say, well, you know, you, you have to be sneaky sometimes, and you have to whisper in the ear of forwards and say, go and stand offside and see what he does. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And I remember doing that as a player the other day who I talked to quite regularly. And I said, look, go and stand offside and come back onside, a bit like uh, Thierry Henry used to do, used to hang around offside all the time. And he, I said, have a go at it and see what the defender does. And uh, pretty much the defender didn't know what to do with him. You know, and uh, but if that defender can practice that, they weren't yeah. on the same team, by the way. So they weren't at the same club. But if uh, if that defender can practice that, then he, he will deal with it, and that's about being adaptive. Yeah, yeah. So it falls; it, it, it just matches perfectly. You know? They're good practices, them that that where yeah, you, again, you, this, the, just the this defenders are of... not sure. You put some doubt into them. Yeah, you're not sure what's happening, and then they solve it. 
this is that second example again of the wingers pressing. Yeah. And then the, the third and final one, just look out for the midfield players pressing for centrally. So just this central press coming onto our centre backs now. And do we recognise, do we really recognise, if I pause that there, look at all that space that is in between the lines a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And it's yeah. also, do, do the, you know, do the forwards and midfield players recognise that that's happening and what they've got? Yeah. So it's a whole yeah. team. That's where the whole team coaching comes in, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's just creating those, creating those different scenarios. Yeah, and you can do that at every level. You can do it in. You can do that in a four v four. You know, it doesn't yeah. have to be eleven v eleven. The principle is absolutely sound. So what you're yeah. doing, you're you're in the red here, looking at um, allowing players to find the solutions. You know, and... right? We've got the last couple of slides. Then just to kind of draw our, draw our conclusions, really. So um, I've got a couple for you, mate. Yeah, I'm, I, I just think that these are really important. And uh, I think some of them have disappeared from our coaching. One is about kids copying. I think demonstrations are really important for kids to see good pictures of if you're doing skills or if you're doing patterns. And you, you do a lot of work with the England teams on, on analysis and, and they see their clips and stuff like that. And and have they got role models? Have kids got role models? And what part of the role model are they copying? Uh, I think demonstrations are really important in, in practice. Uh, I don't think we do them enough. Uh, even if you can't demonstrate, then someone else. How often do you say, hey, look at him. Look what he did. Do that again. Yeah, yeah that was good play. You know, so kids like copying. You know, so I think that's important. I think the trial and error for me is, is one of the, the absolute uh, really essential things to manage because I've got this thing about kids developing and style a playing style and in order to do that they have to try things that didn't work that work that didn't work and if you want to set high challenges if you want to set them um if you want a real high challenging environment then trial and error is going to absolutely be part of that otherwise the kids will play safe it won't be challenging so you have to manage that really well and it, it, it says what it, it does what it says on the tin you trial things out and you make mistakes and you learn from them what you're looking for is to see the kids who are learning off those errors, not yeah. not eliminating the errors. I think that's important. The third one's really obvious, you know. It, it's simple. In, if you want to be a good cyclist, then cycle. If you want to be a good swimmer, swimmer. If you want to be good at football, you've got to play football. And I think the thing is, is uh, you, you, practice is okay, but in the end, you've got to stick that into a match. Are the kids yeah. playing enough? You know, and that that's for another day. But it's really important that the the specificity I can't say it very well of the of practice is that it is so close to football. But then they have to take that practice and dump it into a match, and and everyone has to applaud them if they do well, and so on and so forth. But they've got to be seen to be doing it in the game. The unconscious learning thing is interesting because. Uh, when you talked about directional practices, you know, you get an unconscious compass. You get a, what I call a football compass. You know what's left, you know what's right, you know what's forward, you know what's back. There is stuff that goes on if you keep repeating the game over and over again. And it's not stuff you can pinpoint or assess, but there's this unconscious learning going on all the time. It might be social, it might be psych, but the, if they keep repeating the game, then there's learning going on that you're not you're not aware of and in control of so it's it's little wonder that sometimes you get kids that have been playing football in grassroots and whatever and then they can actually get into the premier league what they've been doing yeah. you know it'd be interesting for a study on that and then finally uh i think that if you want adaptive experts you've got to look at skill and if you want uh if you look at the quote at the bottom, and I quite like this quote, not that I read the New Scientist, but it's difficult to think of any human activity that places more demands on the brain with a possible exception of combat soldiers. And they're referring to football there with the decisions you make and the things in there. And I wonder when we look at players, do we think of players head, heart and feet in that order? Or if you describe a player, do you go, no, he's got great feet. And then you work towards his head and his heart or his heart and his head. But if you look on the right-hand side, 
the spatial awareness, the perception, anticipation, judgment, all that stuff that you've just shown in your practices that's going on leads kids to and players to have a feel and a sense and timing. Yeah. All the players that most of the players that come to England, well, they'll have to be, will have good timing, but that can be improved. And then it's the when and where and how, and that's the decision making. But I urge coaches to think about players top down. Yeah. What's going on yeah, in their head? You know, and that lends itself to looking at practices that challenge them, challenge like you've just shown over there, you know, about I'm going to give you a problem, solve it. Yeah. And then the heart is how much, do, how much do you really want to, you know, what's your motivation levels? You know, no, I don't mean how fast your heart pumps, but I mean, have you ever got the heart for this? You know, I think we look at it feet up. And yeah, I really sure. like that, mate. I think it's a yeah. really, really nice visual, really clear visual. Yeah, I'm and not, I'm not think... sure you'll get the players you want if you look feet up. Yeah, yeah because... I think if we, if we, if we discuss, if we was to talk about like the best players, we often describe them head down, but we don't talk about our own players like that. So if we no. talk about our own players, we talk yeah. about their feet and the mm. touch and the skill. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But if we talk about the top players, we start talking about. Yeah, but Messi's awareness is is incredible, and yeah. Modric's ability to read the game, and Zidane's yeah. uh, poise and control, and do you know what I mean? We we talk mm -hmm. about the best ones top down, but we seem mm. to talk about our own ones bottom up. It's really yeah, I, I, yeah, and uh, it it takes you know some of the little ones, you know some of the little ones who are not physically able at the moment, you know at that time, you know may have brilliant tactical brains. And a heart and motivation, and you should you should really be careful with them. I think the thing is about that. And someone said to me, uh, "Spot the brain and wait for the body." Yeah, nice. Yeah. Nice, I like that. I like that. Well, it looks like we've survived it, mate. In terms of technology, which an hour ago looked uh, doubtful. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you did, but it's probably <laughs> the, there's a button that says on and off. <laughs> I hit the off a few times, I think. Um, no, it's been it's been really good. Like from my yeah. perspective, just yeah. to just to get together and talk Great about football chat. and talk yeah. about coaching. And I think just to end with the 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 why really end with this concept of working towards adaptive expertise or mm. players that can thrive in the biggest moments of the biggest games. Yeah, um, I think it's been the essence of our conversation, um, and it's meandered here, there, and we spoke loads about coaching and practice design and. Mm. And football but i've really enjoyed it mate yeah just one message it takes time to become an adaptive expert it takes a long time you know excellent i think that's a perfect place to wrap it up thanks very much mate no and, problems uh, enjoyed it see you soon stay safe yeah. stay safe and healthy and you see you thanks